the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Price Daniel, Attorney General of Texas. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Attorney General, uh, many of our chronoscope audience know you, of course, as a vigorous young Texas Attorney General who has been fighting the Supreme Court ruling in the Tidelands Oil case. And then recently, you've been in the news by announcing your candidacy against Senator Tom Connolly, who heads the Foreign Relations Committee. Now, tonight, sir, we'd like first for you to tell us why are you a candidate for the Senate? Mr. Huey, I'm a candidate for the United States Senate from Texas because I believe that it is a time for a change in the direction in which our country has been going since World War II. And I believe that the change can be hastened by one who is not obligated to present federal officials. Now, what is your present, your case against the present incumbent? Well, sir, I uh, really thought we were going to discuss some other matters. I'd rather discuss my Senate race in Texas, not in New York. Well, well, you know, the people of Texas will be seeing this program, so I think you're perfectly safe when it goes down there on a couple of the leading stations, so you'll be well, talking to Texas as well as to the rest of the country. Well, that's, that's different. Uh, if I'll be talking to Texans, I'll be glad to tell you that the main points in my platform for the Senate are first, a nonpartisan house cleaning of all disloyalty and dishonesty in uh, our present federal agencies, wherever it may exist. Uh, secondly, a stop to excessive spending and high taxes. Uh, third, a strong preparedness program, but one which will cut out the waste and extravagance in our present program, and which will disappoint the communists by not spending ourselves to death. The fourth plank in my platform is a positive and understandable foreign policy, one which will not yield to communism uh, anywhere on the face of the globe. The fifth plank in my platform is opposition to socialized medicine, socialized farming, and every other form of socialization that our country has been following or trying to follow in recent years. And then the last plank, restoration of our tidelands to our states. Well, now, which one of those uh, points, sir, do you regard, do you think that Texans are most interested in? If you had to point to one issue between yourself and the senator, uh, what issue would you point to as being most important or of most interest to, to Texans? I believe of most interest to Texans is the restoration of simple honesty and moral integrity in our government. I believe that they want someone who will speak out uh, more firmly on the matter, someone who is not under any obligations to present federal agencies or present federal appointees. Of course, now, as far <laughs> as uh, a matter of particular economic interest, I would say the Tidelands issue is of most importance to Texas. Well, what would be your attitude, Mr. Daniel, toward Secretary Atchison, for example, on foreign policy? On foreign policy, I feel that uh, we would have more unity in our country, more unity against our enemies if Secretary Atchison would step down, would resign or be replaced. Well, I'd like to ask you about uh, your attitude toward uh, Mr. Truman. Do you, would you favor his renomination? No, sir. I oppose the renomination of uh, President Truman. I'd do that for several reasons, but you've just asked me, do I favor or oppose his renomination? I'm opposed to his renomination. You mentioned corruption as being 
uh, a vital issue in Texas. I believe you uh, gained some attention uh, from the Keefer Senate Crime Committee for some of your fight against crime and corruption in Texas. Is that correct, sir? That is true. And have you uh, uh, been able to uh, do away with such things as slot machines and other types of organized crime in Texas? We've been able to have some success at the state level. For instance, we led the nation in slot machines last year with 9,555 machines. In less than a year, they've been reduced to zero with the help of the Texas legislature and our county and district attorneys. And then I think the most important thing we've done in Texas is to get the Western Union and telephone companies under injunction uh, to keep them from bringing racehorse gambling information into Texas. That has shut down all of our bookie shop operations. Well, Mr. Daniel, I know this Tidelands case is very close to your heart. You argued this before the Supreme Court as Attorney General. Uh, what do you think of the decision of the court in that case? Well, of course, Mr. Hazlitt, I think the decision is, uh, uh, is incorrect. The court refused to hear the evidence. For the first time in the history of the Supreme Court, that court denied a state the right to introduce evidence in a contested lawsuit. Well, could you uh, explain uh, briefly what the uh, essence of the case was, what was involved in this Tidelands case? Uh, yes, as you know, the Tidelands problem involves the claim of the federal government to submerge lands within state boundaries, heretofore recognized to belong to, to be the property of the states. That's all of the states. In our country, for over a hundred years, it has been recognized that the states own the lands beneath navigable waters within their boundaries. In addition to that, Texas had a special annexation agreement by which we specifically retained all of our unsold lands when we entered the United States. Now, after a hundred years of recognizing that this property belonged to the states, in recent years, federal officials came along and sued Texas, California, and Louisiana, and now claims uh, the property from many of the other states. Now, Mr. Well, Attorney General, <coughs> let's see what's at, uh, what's at stake here. Now, First, do just states uh, fronting on oceans have tide lands? Is it, is, it, does, is it a problem that concerns only those states that are on the oceans? The immediate problem concerns those states which are on the oceans are the Great Lakes, 21 coastal and Great Lakes states. Now, tide lands has, be, has come to be, to mean uh, the lands within the original boundaries below low tide, below the beaches, out to yes. the state's seaward boundary. Now, is great wealth at stake in these tide lands? Yes. And, and what, uh, in, in Texas particularly, of course, oil is, is what's at stake there. Oil is uh, our most valuable resource in our tide lands. And so it's a, and essentially it's a conflict between the state and the federal government for the control of valuable oil lands. Uh, that is true with respect to Texas, Louisiana, and California. Other states now have just as valuable resources. Does New York State, New Jersey, or states in, in, in the northern area, does that have... Uh, that is correct. New York and New Jersey have sand, uh, shell, fish, and other things in that area which are bringing in considerable revenues to the states and to the people of the states. Also, I'd like to remind you that New York has millions and millions of dollars worth of improvements built beyond low tide at long, along Long Beach, uh, Coney Island, and uh, a lot of fill lands have been improved, reclaimed and improved. The federal government's now claiming that property. And, and this issue uh, <coughs> is the issue to decide whether the federal government should have control over all such things as you've just mentioned, including the oil in Texas and other, other valuable the oil properties. Oil in Texas, the iron ore under the Great Lakes, coal under the West Virginia streams, and so forth. And the well, Supreme Mr. Daniels, Court... Uh, pardon me, uh, Bill, I just wanted to find out, clarify this question. Mr. Daniels, isn't the question also of private property involved in the way that the Supreme Court worded its decision? Many good lawyers, including members of the American Bar Association and the American Title, Associ Title Association, uh, feel that the federal government could take private property as well as state property under the theory of these Tidelands decisions. And therefore, I think you're correct. If ever federal officials had the nerve to go that far, toward nationalizing property, I believe they could do it under the theory of these decisions. And your contention, one of your contentions also is that the uh, Supreme Court in effect, in effect nullified a solemn treaty between the federal government and Texas when Texas entered the Union. No doubt about it, Mr. Hazlitt. Texas had a solemn contract saying 
first, we offered to give the United States all our unsold lands if they'd assume our, uh, our uh, indebtedness of $10 million. The United States Senate in 1844 turned that down. They said the lands are worthless. You keep your lands and pay your own debts. Texas was the only state required to do that, to pay its own indebtedness. Well, then they submitted to us a written proposition to keep our lands and pay our own debts. We did it. We lived up to our part of the agreement. The United States lived up to its part of the agreement for 100 years until the land became valuable and until some federal influence peddlers wanted to get federal leases on the property. Then they broke the agreement. Now, has the, the federal government, the Supreme Court has said that these valuable lands, in effect, belong to the federal government, has it not? Yes, they've used the term paramount powers. I see. And you're trying to go through Congress to get legislation re-establishing or redefining states' rights, state ownership to these tied lands. That is correct. Uh, the attorneys general and governors of more than 40 states have been sponsoring legislation in the Congress uh, for the return of this property and clearly defining the difference between political rights and property rights. Well, Mr. Attorney General, as a final question, I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the most serious problem that the people of the United States face this year? I think the most serious problem we face is to get rid of some of this concentration of power in Washington. We have too much power centralized in our national sovereign. It's bringing on a lot of the inefficiency plunder, graft, and corruption. And I say that the big problem is to get our government back to the people. I believe that's the, best, the biggest problem facing us today. Well, we appreciate very much the light you've thrown on this problem, and we appreciate very much the time you've taken to come up here with us. Thank you. Thank you. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Price Daniel, Attorney General of Texas. Travelers to the Olympic Winter Games at Oslo, from wherever they come, will find the familiar touch of home in windows of fine jewelry stores. Longines, the world's most honored watch. For the fame of Longines is worldwide. In the mountain-high city of La Paz, Bolivia in South America, or historic Athens in ancient Greece, or the sacred city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, in any of the capitals of 77 countries of the free world, the watch of first choice with discriminating men and women is Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. These are Longines watches. And if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, for yourself or as a gift, you're paying the price of a Longines. Why not insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch? Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Longines, exclusive official watch for the Olympic Winter Games of 1952. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast, by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is Frank Knight speaking. This is the CBS Television Network.